pew, 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 pew. Hey guys, uh, thank you for tuning in to another episode of In Range. Um, what we wanted to do is give you a status update on the What Would Stoner Do 2017 project. Yeah. Uh, we've ran both these rifles now in a number of events, some two, two GACME events, yep. some of the Arizona 2-Gun. We also ran it through Hard as Hell. I think that was like eight days of shooting. Uh, yes. Maybe nine, ten? Yeah, maybe, yeah, a lot. With beatings? With beatings. There yeah. were some whips and chains involved. Um, I ran it through the, and there's a video actually that will be out before you see this, uh, Rio Salado, which is typically a 3-Gun environment. Mm -hmm. I ran my door kicker rifle through their now two gun embedded event yeah which was really cool um and i think that we're going to get a lot more data and value by going to multiple different match env environments yep and as a result we're going to be concentrating this down to the best solution possible of what we want the what would stoner do rifles to be right so i want to point out we've gotten a lot of people asking us like just tell us what all the parts are well we're not because we can't because we don't know yet uh we have the concept mm -hmm. some of the bits we're extremely happy with um, the, the GWAX slash cav arms lowers, for example, no question there, we're not changing that. Um, there are people trained who are like replicating these guns using other standard polymer lowers. Don't do it. They all suck. The only polymer lower that there's any point to using is the GWAX one because it's, we'll get into this and because it's designed to be made out of polymer. When we get into the deep dive on the lower, which we are going to do, we're going to have a pretty significant video on that. Right. These are not perfect either. No, um, no. These are the best no. of breed right. polymer lowers. But if you're going to be replicating a what would stoner do build, this is the only one that we quote unquote approve for the project because it's the only one built with polymer in mind. Right. Okay. But the point being so, is we've had more progress with the door kicker rifle than we have the rifle rifle. Yep. Let me explain that in a minute. Pretty much this is almost done. Yeah, we can almost give you the full build out on this. There's a couple things still in flux. Right. Well, we've got different charging handles on these. We're, we're right experimenting now, with and... that example. So the charging handle on this is going to change potentially. Yep. Uh, I do not have all the ambidextrous bits on this rifle yet, but we're going to. Yep. We're going to have both of these be fully ambi when we're done. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing is testing a couple different subcomponents on each rifle. Right. To come to the best answer entirely. So this gun, for example, barrel good. Uh, carbon fiber flow tube, we know we're there. The lower, we know we're there. The trigger, we know we're there. That's why we did the deep drive on the trigger. We were yep. already ready to approve the trigger. Um, we have stuff coming on the optics and other stuff. But anyways, the door kicker is further along, and this has really met most of the goals we wanted it right off the bat. Yeah. Um, this one, Yep. not quite so much. Well, what's interesting about that is... Hold on a sec. Put that down. What's interesting about that is I think we've had an epiphany throughout some of the shooting we did. Yes. Hard as hell was a significant part of that, but as were some of the two-gun events. Yeah. Um, we were talking about this, and I think some of you are going to go, told you so, which is fair. So we're not perfect, and we will make mistakes from here to here, here time to time. When we were doing this, we described mine as the door kicker gun, or the standard carbine. Yep. And we described this as the DMR, and I think we were off one notch. Yep, exactly. I think my rifle, the door kicker, is actually the specialized gun. Mm -hmm. That's the gun that when you see a building and you need the guys to go in there and breach that with CQB... Throw on the red dot, throw on the night vision, have the laser, have the small, short, handy gun, go do the job. That dude's first in the stack. Exactly. That's like the specialist gun. It's meant for a specific purpose. Right. It right. is not a general purpose, right? That's not the GP rifle. Right. This should be the DP ri GP rifle, which means it's not the DMR. Right. And that's the mistake we made. And what's happened, when we started thinking about it, what we realized is the concept of DMR has changed in probably the last 20 years. Okay. And it's changed really because of primarily optics. So the U.S. Army always had this standard description of capability that, you know, the, the Army infantrymen can deliver effective fire out to 600 meters, yards. 600 yards has always been kind of the number. So, for example, the, the Marine M16A2 KD range is 500 mm -hmm. meters. Yeah. But other, like, for example, the NRA or service rifle matches go to 600 yards. Right. Roughly 500 to 600 yards. But that's kind of a pile of crap. And by the way, that means effective aimed fire. They mm -hmm. believe indirect fire out to 800. Okay. But but aimed fire, see a man, hit a man at 600. But here's the thing. You can't see a man at 600 with iron sights. Not in the field, not except in extraordinarily unorthodox environment. Right. Like, and for example, if a guy silhouettes himself on a hill, uh, okay. but he's an idiot. Yes. In, in most <laughs> circumstances, you're not going to see or identify a target. Even if you see a man, you're probably not wise to engage it because you can't identify what it is. Right. The only way you can actually effectively, practically engage a target at 600 is if you have magnified optics to see it with. And what we realized is that if we're going to be putting an optic, a magnified optic on every rifle, all of a sudden that 600 yards effective aimed fire becomes a realistic 
option. It suddenly becomes something that everyone's wanted, realized, right? right. So before, let me start, before mm -hmm. guys come in and go, I can hit stuff at 600 yards all day. Yeah, you can. I shot high power right. at 600 and 1,000 yards with iron sights. Right. But that's shooting at a giant black circle on a white piece of paper. These are not field combat conditions. It's not about hitting the target. No. It's about seeing the target in the first place. Can I hit a target at 600 yards with iron sights? Yeah. Should I? Don't know. And in field conditions, that's a questionable and thing. Do you know the target's there? Exactly. Can you find, Precisely. you can hit it. If you can find it, but so, can you even find it? So the point we came to is my gun, the door kicker, you know, I, I have left the magnifier off of that. While it could have a magnifier, mm -hmm. a 3 or 4X, because I don't want to convolute the conversation. We're leaving the door yep. kicker alone in its current guise. Right. But when we started playing with this, we, we originally looked at this primary arms optic, and we're going to have a review on the optic. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm shooting this at the two-gun match tomorrow, Yeah. because I haven't shot this rifle yet. I'm shooting it suppressed with a specialized bolt carrier group to test out some of our what would stoner do concepts. And I'm using this optic so that when we do this review, I can be more thorough. Right. I have a lot of first-hand experience with it, but you don't yet. And however, so what I want to say on that is, well, we had the revelation at heart as hell, which is, this is the rifleman rifle. And by if, if all of the riflemen were optically sighted, that 600-yard panacea goal becomes a realistic right. one. It used to be the, the one guy with the optical sight who could make a hit to 600, he was the squad DMR. Mm -hmm. He had a ZF-41 if he was a German in World War II. He had an M1C or an M1D or an O3A4 if he was an American. He had a Type 97 Arasaka if he was Japanese. Or he has an SVD in some Soviet platoon. Yeah. Same or idea. he has a... He's... Like, the French Army, the 4956s all have scope rails, but only selected guys actually got magnified optics to go on them. What we're changing here is all of a sudden, if we put a scope on every rifleman's rifle, now that's the standard, the designated marksman, that dude who is the best shot... His standard of gear has just gone up a notch. Yesterday's DMR is today's rifleman. And so what we're doing is doubling down on this concept of optics, optics and the rifle config. A lightweight optics, a lightweight platform rifle enabling the optics to enable every rifleman to be what would have been a DMR 20, 30 years ago. Right. Now, now the sniper is now the DMR. The DMR is now the rifleman. And there is still room for a DMR, but we're not. What we're saying here is at this moment, we're not addressing that in this this What Would Stoner Do project. Right. We're addressing the door kicker specialist carbine, and we're addressing the rifleman's carbine. And our idea would be that this, when we're done with it, this 18-inch config, every rifleman would have that rifle yep. with the same optic on it that would enable the entire squad of riflemen to be truly effective at 600. Exactly. And now, how does that affect the what parts we put together? How does that affect the rifle design? Basically, just the optic itself. Everything else here, well, as it every other major component, we're, we're on point. With. We're on point with the exception of the optic. Right. The optic was something that we you were more a little more enamored with it than I was right mm -hmm. off the bat, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. This is there's room for experimentation there. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I come at this from a twenty years of biased perspective. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot, seen a lot. You've seen less. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, "Okay, let's give this a whirl," I think that's a viable thing to try. I'm not saying you were wrong. We don't know. Right off the bat, I might have discarded it without even trying. Right. It's good to try. Yep. And what we've come to find, and I think a lot of you are going to go, oh, I know, I told you so, which is fine. This was not, by no means, is it a DMR, and it's also probably not the rifleman's rifle either. Not quite. Not the optic. This is more of a precision at short range optic. Right. If you need to see something better at 100 or 150, this is great. Yep. If you need to see something at 2, 3, 4, not so much. It's more of a replacement for a red dot that gives you a boost over a red dot but is not yet a rifleman's rock. This is an alternative to a red dot with a magnifier. Yes. And I think it's a great alternative. I really, given its price point, mm. I think this is a cool scope. And of course, we either already have published or are going to publish a review of this scope. So we don't need to go into No, it. we'll have a review on that in general. But the question is, if you're going to have a standardized rifleman's optic, there are a bunch of different options. You could have, this is one, you could have a fixed low magnification scope, Mm -hmm. You could have a red dot with a magnifier, uh, you know, a, a flip-off magnifier. So you've got just a red dot when you want close, and then you pew, flip over a, like a 3x magnifier for longer range. Mm -hmm. You could have something like a, a two-position, uh, like an Elkan Spectre, mm -hmm. uh, where it's one power or four power just at the flip of a lever. Mm -hmm. You could have a more traditional variable power optic, where it's one to four, one to six, one to eight, with a, a crank on the, the rear bell of the scope. Um... Am I leaving out anything? Well, and then and that when you get the variables, you start dealing with variables that are 1 to 4 versus 1 to 6 versus 1 to 8, and the or, weight that or, comes with those choices. Or maybe even 2.5 to 7. True, true. Now, I will say on the door kicker gun, the carbine, the specialist gun, I will, I'm, I will double down on the red dot mm -hmm. because you want no eye relief concerns 
right. whatsoever. When you are in high stress, close range situations, you don't want to deal with any eye relief, even the eye relief of a 1x variable, in my opinion. So that's why if it's a specialized gun for kicking indoors and going to buildings or doing that street combat, I say the red dot with no eye relief whatsoever is a winning concept. Right. I'm not changing that. But what we're doing here is changing this. You know, when they went from the M16 to the M16A1, they didn't change the sights. Mm -hmm. When they went to the M16A2, they changed the sights dramatically mm -hmm. for the same reasons we're talking about changing the optically, optical sighting system for the rifleman's rifle with our What Was Done or Do project. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make the M16 more capable at range with better iron sights. We're saying now, ditch the iron sights, do it with a scope. Right. So we are going to be looking at, we're already working on getting examples of a bunch of these different types of optics. And we're going to look at a bunch of them. This isn't going to be an overnight thing. This is going to take us a while. Because anytime, whenever we, every time we put a new scope on this thing, we want to actually get some legitimate trigger time with it on in competition, on timers, and in a variety of different conditions. So it'll take us a while to crank through all of these different options. But in the end, I think what we're going to have is a really interesting and valuable assessment of the different kinds of options that you have out there with two different perspectives. My pretty much going in blind because I, I don't shoot much with scopes. And yeah, we've had some interesting arguments yeah. about this. Yes. Even arguments, um, actually, not debates. Yeah. 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 Um, so we'll have my going in blind perspective and we'll have your 20 years of shooting experience yep. uh, perspective. And hopefully people will uh, really get something valuable out of that series. We're dead serious about the importance of, to us, at least, for this What Would Stoner Do project. Mm -hmm. And when we're done with this project, we want these to be an example of what we think this should be. Yeah. Whether you agree or not isn't relevant, frankly. It's what we think this should be. The door right. kicker is very close. The rifle in its rifle guise is close. The optical sighting system is not. This needs to be fixed. Yep. And when we get there, and it's going to take time because we need to find the sweet spot between weight versus capability versus battery versus no battery. All these things yep. apply. And if you talk to a dedicated competition shooter, he says, that's the solution. You talk to a guy that was in the sandbox for two tours, he says, that's the solution. They're probably both right in weird ways. Exactly. There is a middle ground between all of these worlds, and our goal is to find what that is to make the rifleman's rifle, not the DMR, that's a different discussion at this yep. point, we're updating that, the rifleman's rifle, something that would truly make that rifleman effective, viably effective, out to that 600. Right. I think it's awesome. I think it's a good evolution of the project. Yep. And I think that this is the only way to do this sort of thing right. You don't take something, try it once at one match, and go, that's it. That's the answer. Because that's the way you get the wrong answer. Exactly. That means you got either incredibly lucky, or lucky, or far more likely you're ignoring things and you're missing the point. The reason the door kicker gun came close was because I've been shooting guns like that for a long time. So this one is a little different in that regard and yep. we're exploring that territory differently. Mm -hmm. And this is where we have to ask the viewer to be patient. Yeah. Because we're not able to tell you, here's the solution, here's where What Would Stoner Do Project is done until we're done. You know, we could have done all the work behind the scenes and then come to you in a year with, this is, in our idea, the perfect infantry combat rifle. But we think it would be a lot more interesting for you to basically ride along with us through the process as we try out different things that may or may not work. And it may inspire your thought process as well. So, right. so on that note, I think we're, you gotta, you're going to travel with us. Yep. We're going to come to the best solution possible from our perspective. It's going to be a learning experience for everyone. And what I can tell you is that when we do a specific deep dive on a subcomponent, mm -hmm. like we did the trigger, and we will be doing with other parts we're already done with, that means we are then certifying from an in-range perspective. I know it sounds corny, but we are saying that thing, good to go. Yep. We've looked at all the alternatives, yep. and this is the one we've decided we, on. We have decided on this. We're good to go. So when you see a what would Stoner do deep dive on anything, trigger uh, the, uh, the free float tube, the lower, or whatever, that means this is what we are saying is officially not changing in the project. Right. If we had not done a deep dive on that yet, it might shift. Mm -hmm. So don't try to replicate those right off the bat unless you want to go along for the ride because you may not get the answer we're going to be done with until we're done. Right. So I think it's really interesting. I think it's a really cool idea to, to really revitalize the concept or reinvestigate that yesterday's DMR is today's rifleman. Yeah. And that's the crux of this story. And boy, it brings up some interesting possibilities for a, a DMR by that standard. It does, but that's a oh, different topic. Man. we got too much yep. going on right now, but I think that this will devolve or evolve into a... What would Stoner do DMR project? What would Stoner do DMR 2019? No, maybe 2018. <laughs> We're going to finish this this year, but maybe that's where it'll go. Yeah. And you know what? It dovetails really interestingly into our What If Lever Gun project. Yeah. The concepts are the same. The application mm -hmm. of technology is different. Yep. But that's cool because they're really reflecting each other 
uh, in different periods. It's very cool to see how these concepts don't change, although the technology does. So if that's the case and this is the stuff you're interested in, please stay tuned and stick with us on this because this is going to be an evolving project and it's going to be, I really believe we're going to have incredible results in the long run. Yeah. So if you're not already a Patreon supporter, please consider doing so. This is what's enabling us to do this type of what I believe to be an intellectual exercise. Yep. This is not mainstream firearms content. Right. And remember, yeah. we will eventually come to a decision on each component that we like. Hmm. That's because we like the component, not because we got it for free, which oh. sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Some of these parts we got from manufacturers. Some of them we bought ourselves. Mm -hmm. Just because we get it from someone doesn't mean that we're going to like it or we're going to tell you it's good. I'll add that to that. The one mm -hmm. thing that we can say to that is that if we got a component that we did not pay for directly, it's because we solicited them, not the other way. Right. No one came to us and said, we think you should use this widget. Right. No one has done that. Or if they have, we kind of exclude them. The reality is, unless it was something interesting, but that hasn't happened, the right. people that have come to us saying you should use this have always been sort of, no, yeah. no thanks. Um, but So if we do get something that wasn't paid for directly by the project, we went to them and said, we are interested in this. And they're like, oh, we love your stuff. Why don't we give you one? Right. That has happened, honestly. Yep. But it's because we went to them, not vice versa. Yeah. So anyways, this is not uh, mainstream firearms-related content. This is intellectual exercise. And it's for people that I think, in my opinion, really are interested in this type of a topic. And so it's Patreon supporters that have made us made it possible to do this type of mainstream content because depending on YouTube views isn't a reality when you get into this kind of deep dive. That's true. But in Range TV, we really don't care about YouTube views anymore because we are wholly viewer supported. So thank you for doing that. If you can't do that or you are already doing that, thank you. The other most important thing you can do is subscribe and share the content so that we don't have to depend on anybody's AI bot or algorithms <laughs> to get this message out. Indeed. So thanks, thanks guys. Thanks for watching.